Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on calcium signalling. Now, this video is really one of the most important videos of the entire playlist. This video, we're going to look at the GQ pathway, also sometimes called uh, the phosphoinositide pathway, and uh, we're going to look at how it's involved in calcium signalling. So we're basically going to look at the different um, the different types of calcium signals that the GQ pathway can um, give rise to. And there's three different types of calcium signal that it can give rise to. And these are blips, waves, and uh, puffs, basically. And really, I shouldn't have said them in that order. It should have been blips, puffs, and waves, because they're in order of increasing severity, if you like. Right. So, uh, let's begin by uh, looking at the general GQ pathway, and then we'll see how different levels of activation of the GQ pathway can either give rise to a calcium blip, a calcium puff, and then if it's huge and global, um, uh, activation of the GQ pathway can give rise to calcium waves, and then how if you, the um, intensity of the stimulation of the GQ pathway after that is encoded by the frequency of the calcium wave. Okay, right. So, let's say we have a cell here, like so. And basically, in this cell, what's going to happen is we are going to stimulate uh, G-protein coupled receptors, and we're going to keep it deliberately general. We're going to, couple, we're going to stimulate a G-protein uh, coupled receptor that is coupled to the uh, GQ G protein, basically. So this is a GPCR. Okay, so let's take that piece of membrane out with that GPCR in, and let's have a look at the signaling pathway it's going to be involved in. So here is our GPCR, which is this seven transmembrane receptor, meaning that it has seven membrane-spanning alpha helices. So it's our GPCR. Okay, and basically, uh, the reason it's called a GPCR is that it stands for G-protein coupled receptor. And indeed, it is coupled to a G-protein. And we are going to look specifically at G-protein coupled receptors, which are coupled to the GQ G-protein. So, um, G-protein coupled receptors are all coupled to heterotrimeric G-proteins, which have three different subunits, an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and a gamma subunit, like so. So here's the alpha subunit. In the middle is the beta subunit, and here is the gamma subunit. I'm just going to move this out a bit. Okay, and basically there are absolutely loads of different heterotrimeric G proteins you can make, because there are 16 different alpha subunits, there are 5 different beta subunits, and there are 12 different gamma subunits, basically. So there is a great many combinations of heterotrimeric G proteins that you can make. The name of the G protein overall it is um, determined by which alpha subunit you use. So, if you use the alpha Q alpha subunit, then your heterotrimeric G protein is known as GQ, a GQ heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, so we are picking a GPCR which is coupled to the uh, GQ heterotrimeric G protein, which means that the alpha subunit of this heterotrimeric G protein is the alpha Q subunit. Okay, so uh, initially, uh, the alpha subunit is inactive, well, the heterotrimeric G protein is inactive, which means that the alpha GQ subunit is bound to GDP. Okay, uh, and I just want, should have said, actually, uh, that we don't care, basically, what the beta and the gamma subunits are. If you have alpha Q as your alpha subunit, then you are a GQ G protein. Okay, so if the GQG protein is inactive, then it means that the uh, alpha Q subunit is has GT, GDP uh, bound to it, guanosine diphosphate. Okay, now, um, when the G protein coupled receptor is inactive, then some G protein coupled receptors, depending on which G protein coupled receptor it specifically is, some of them are actually physically linked to the inactive GQG protein. On the other hand, some are not. Some of them will uh, not be physically linked to the inactive G protein, and instead, the inactive G protein will be bound to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer, basically. 
But the point is that the heterotrimet G protein is not too far away from the G protein coupled receptor. So when the ligand comes for this G protein coupled receptor, which I'll denote here, so this is the ligand for our G protein coupled receptor, ligand, uh, then um, the uh, G protein coupled receptor will become catalytically active, and I don't want to use that color, I've already used that color. Um, the G protein coupled receptor will become catalytically active. And the reaction that it catalyzes is the chopping off of this GDP molecule from the alpha subunit and the taking of a GTP molecule, which was free in the cytoplasm, and binding that GTP molecule to the alpha subunit. So basically, uh, you get an alpha subunit that is now bound to GTP, and this was specifically the alpha Q subunit. Okay, so this is alpha Q here. And some people would write this, um, this new molecule, which is alpha Q bound to GTP, as alpha Q GTP. So if you see that ever, that's what it means. Okay, and basically once you've bound GTP to the alpha Q subunit, it no longer wants to stay bound to the beta and the gamma subunits. So the beta and the gamma subunits go off, they remain with each other forever, and uh, this other sort of lump that you get off from the heterotrimeric G protein is hereafter denoted the beta gamma subunit. Right. Okay, so alpha-Q GTP has abandoned its beta-gamma subunit, it's now got its GTP uh, bound with it, and it's going to go and activate an another enzyme which is in the phospholipid bilayer of the cell. Okay, so this enzyme which I'll draw here, and we'll also draw out below here, okay, is an enzyme known as phospholipase C. And specifically, the form of phospholipase C, uh, which uh, the alpha-Q GTP subunit activates, is phospholipase C beta, or uh, PLC beta for short. Okay, so um, often people just denote it as a phospholipase C, but the specific type that is activated by alpha-Q GTP is phospholipase C beta, basically. Okay, so um, what do phospholipase C's, uh, C enzymes catalyze? Well, when they're activated by this alpha QGTP um, um, mo molecule, uh, then uh, they're going to take a component of the phospholipid bilayer and they're going to break it down basically. And the component of the uh, phospholipid bilayer they take is a, is a molecule known as PIP2 which stands for phosphatidyl inositol uh, 4 5 bisphosphate. So here is our phosphatidyl inositol 4 5 bisphosphate drawn as a cartoon. Okay, so um, the name of this in short is just PIP2, and you will see it uh, denoted as that very often. Uh, but in full, its full name is phosphatidyl, which means uh, a phospholipid group. Uh, so, uh, basically, what you see here is, um, I've drawn in cartoon, two hydrophobic tails representing the long-chain carboxylic acids that are esterified to our glycerol molecule, which is uh, this portion here. This is our glycerol molecule here, this flat horizontal portion. And then you've got this phosphate group bound to the third hydroxyl group of your glycerol molecule. So that's a phospholipid. So that's where uh, this uh, phosphatidyl uh, prefix comes from. It means you've attached a phospholipid group to something. And then you've got inositol. And inositol refers to this six carbon, mo um, well, this six carbon ring, uh, which has um, six hydroxyl groups, one off each of the carbons of the ring. So inositol refers to that portion of the structure there. So, so far we've got phosphatidyl inositol, which is this structure with this structure, and then we've just got these two phosphate groups bound on here. Okay, so um, in the PIP2 name, PI means phosphatidyl inositol, and then we've got P for phosphate twice. Uh, but in, it, in the full name, this is phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. Okay, so this is not what the enzyme makes. This is the substrate for the enzyme. This is what is normally in the phospholipid bilayer, which this enzyme is going to break down. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.